Welcome back to the Inquisitive Analyst. I'm your host, Marcus Udikang. Today is the second of a three-part series, where we go back to some clips from earlier interviews on project management. We'll hear from Rami Kagni on agile project management in the construction industry. Dharam Singh provides a sterling example of transitioning into program and portfolio management. Dario Sunmi captivates us with how artificial intelligence can hugely benefit PMs. Joe Puz enlightens us on how PMs can effectively function with a PMO. We'll also hear from Torbjorn Zetterlin on optimizing cloud strategies. Joe Purzel on the dark arts of project management. Bharat Kumar Unarkat gives us his story of how the Navy prepares you for project management. Chris Klaus helps us to adapt to transformational changes in the financial industry. And Anatoly Shamkin sparkles our attention with transitioning from a project manager to a product manager. We end with Greta Blash identifying and managing risks on a project. So sit back, enjoy the show, and we'll see you at the end of the video. Agile project management, is it actually used in the construction industry? And if, if so, how do they use it? Yeah, of course it's used in the agile and uh, construction industry. However, due to the nature of the industry, you can't use agile as a pure agile. So we use hybrid. But, uh, it's an approach, uh, waterfall agile approach. So basically, during the planning phase, we use an agile approach. So we include the client, all the consultants, the architect, the CM, which is the construction manager, all of us on one table. We do the plans and iterations. We do small iterations, send them over. We get feedback. We improve. So we end up with a design that is consistent with all the requirements by the client and which is within our budget, of course, and uh, timeline. Then when you move into the construction phase, it's so tough to do agile. Like you cannot uh, do one floor yeah. and then say, how can I change the upper floor? It's, yeah. it's, it's more, less flexible. So we go with waterfall. So it's, it's, it's a hybrid. And, 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 you know, the design build is more of a traditional uh, approach. But the integrated project management is more of an agile hybrid, uh, agile water for hybrid approach, okay. which is what we use here in the projects I manage. You become a project manager and then you decide after a few years you want to transition into program or portfolio management. So what's, what's a good path that you recommend to accomplish this goal? See, uh, when we talk about program management, professional uh, program management and portfolio management, these are again, you know, it's not the same skill as we talk at the project level. We just, ups, you know, go to the next level. And if we see that way, generally, it's a hierarchy. We say that, okay, I've, now I've done four years or three years of project management. Can I be a program manager? Now I've done three, four years of program manager. Now can I be a portfolio manager? It's a good path, but don't just say that because I've never done any project management, I cannot be a program manager. I cannot be a portfolio manager. So that they are in, not directly connected. Actually, one lady from Kenya called me one day. Uh, it's very interesting. And uh, she said, Dharam, I want to do PGM. I said, great. Uh, I love to talk, uh, think like this. Why not? Uh, I just looked at her you know, LinkedIn profile and said, uh, just look at title. I said, what's your title, by the way? Dharam, I, my role is assistant project coordinator. I said, project coordinator, one thing. And you assistant to that. I'm thinking in my mind. Then I asked her, what kind of budget you have? Oh, Dharam, I am looking after Nairobi's, you know, Kenya's capital, and the road, and rail services, and airline industry. Mm. Said, what? And uh, and I normally have budget of six to ten billion dollar. Wow. So, what I'm what I'm trying to say, the title is not telling you anything. Mm -hmm. Title, because people look for uh, you know this kind of role as a pro, you know some kind of CEO director position, and this person, this lady has. A, title of assistant, uh, I think junior, junior assistant, junior deputy project coordinator. Yeah. So it's nothing to the, the, the title. Sometimes mm -hmm. if you don't know, you ask the right people, the Durham or anybody that, that I am a project manager, I am a you know, project coordinator. Can I apply for this job you know, certificate? And ask the person to analyze it for you. And you mm -hmm. never know that you already have that eligibility. 
because for the program, you're running multiple projects, interdependent projects and realizing benefits. So that's the program. Portfolio is when you are selecting the right work so that the organization can achieve the strategy or direction or the vision for the organization. So that kind of thing. So if you have that kind of designation role, then you can apply for the certificate to, to get yourself. Or if not, you can see, can you get into these smaller or starting projects, uh, programs and portfolio? Uh, you put your hands up uh, whenever there's a requirement, you just tell them, you know, I want you to do that. And you never know, you get the chance as well. Yeah. Unless you apply, nobody will know that you have interest. You're big in artificial intelligence, right? What's what, what's one part of artificial intelligence that stands out? Actually, you have a you have a master's degree in artificial intelligence too. I should. I do. Out. Yeah. Yeah. So what's what, what's one part of artificial intelligence that stands out to, to hugely benefit project managers and, and why? Yeah. No, I mean, there, there's a lot. It's one of those areas I found really exciting. Obviously, you know, because I spent some time in that space, but just because of the potential, you know, as long as it's used in an ethical way, I think there's a lot of potential there. So there's things around, you know, augmented reality or machine learning, mm. but I think. From a from a project management perspective, what where I think there could be the most benefit will be in the area of I guess decision support. You know, mm -hmm. so as project managers, we you know we're faced with decisions on a very very regular basis. So having a mechanism where, as a PM, you're able to have access to some anonymized data of potentially similar experiences in the past, whether it's within your organization or somewhere else where people were at a crossroads, they had to make a decision and tracking the outcome of that decision as well can sort of help a PM with her team. For example, if she's trying to make a decision, uh, critical decision at the time to say, you know what, if I make this decision, what are the pros and cons and what could potentially happen? And just working out some, I guess, some scenario planning. I think, you know, using AI as a, as a way to hold vast amounts of data mm -hmm. and then also help reason through a process of, you know, what, consequences might come out of a decision would definitely be something where I think AI can help. And, you know, again, we've got other things where we've got things like, you know, robotic process automation, we have bots in place these days, but I think being able to just support a decision-making process is, is where I see a lot of value. And I've been trying to do a bit of work in that area as well in my sort of spare time, just to see, you know, how, how we can not, not replace the human, but just help support that decision-making process. How can how can project managers function more effectively with a PMO? Well, it's a great question. If if we think uh, about HR professionals or sales professionals, they all have a home organization that they go to where there's managers and they have experience on how to train them and how to make them be better at their task. Project management, what we find, because it is one of the roles I have, right, is managing director of the PMO global survey is leadership of the PMO is a lacking, right? We, we yeah. haven't really hit our stride uh, as an industry with leadership. So as a project manager who may or may not work within a PMO, the first thing to do is where is my local resource or chapter, maybe a PMI chapter or some other one of the organizations you may belong in to be able to find peers that I can interact with and get training courses and, and get better or sites like the PMO leader and others. So I think the, the challenge for the PM is do you have a good PMO leader who provides the resources to help your career get better, right? Is, are they, do they have a budget to be able to provide training, right? In our survey, what we found out is about 30 to 40% of the PMO leaders don't even have a training budget. Mm -hmm. So how do they help their team get the skills that they need to help grow their career if they don't have the funding they need? Well, part of why they don't have that funding is they don't understand how to be a leader within an organization and go through the political dynamics to go get a budget to help their team get the tools and training they need. So I think part of being a better PM or Agilist or BA, whatever the role may be, is to ensure that you're working with an organization that has strong leadership that can really help and support you. In your experience, how and where can project managers be best used to optimize those cloud strategies and services? I think uh, they, they'd be excellent in uh, product management, uh, like product manager and manage the process of, uh, uh, of the product development. Uh, 
you know, I mentioned Agile before, it's hard for me to see a role for a project manager in an Agile process, right? But uh, it depends on the size of the projects also, mm -hmm. because you can have many Agile teams also, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So you you may have a, a very senior project manager that uh, manage or not manage but works with a product manager of delivering different part of a, a, a deliver right. deliverable right? right. So either you know so so there are roles for them to do. Uh, you know they can also uh, be part of. What project managers often do is negotiate the deliverables mm -hmm. and cost and timeline with clients, right? So that's they can uh, uh, they do that pretty well, right? Depending on the project manager, right? But uh, it's all down to the project manager itself, right? Uh, the skill sets in them and so on. So, how is just out of curiosity, has Greenpeace gone mostly agile now? With cloud, or are they still doing a bit of a hybrid? Uh, we we have pro project managers. Uh, they uh, are more like product manager. We do have agile teams, so uh, our support team is agile. Uh, our ops team is agile, so they work in cycles uh, of one or two weeks. So the work is planned. Uh, it's a combination. One of the topics that you discuss is the dark arts of project management. It sounds like something out of Star Wars. What is the dark arts of project management? What does it include? One of my comments is think more Yoda and less the enforcer. Uh, I mean, it's all, when I was a staff manager uh, at, at the Cargill International Multi Foods and Minnesota Workers Comp, Everybody reported to me. So I had direct authority over what they did. Um, but in later years, um, when I was running projects as a consultant or staff employee, um, I didn't have that authority. All I had was my influence. So the dark arts of project management is all about how you can use influence and politics to be successful at running projects. Um, you can, you know, whether it's with a team, subject matter experts, sponsors and executives, external people, HR, whatever the deal is, um, you need to know how to play their game and influence them to get what needs to be done so you can be successful. So that session, that workshop is a lot of hints and trick, tricks on how to influence others without they, them knowing they're being influenced because <laughs> no, nobody really wants to be yeah. manipulated because it's yeah. just influencing for good outcomes. Yeah, yeah. A lot of that probably has has to do with really good, strong communication skills, you know, being able to talk back and forth and give people what they want, I guess. The understand what's in it for them. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Understand what's in it for them. Give them what they want. And they'll give you what you want type of thing, sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. They'll take away those barriers that will enable your project to get done more efficiently. That type of thing. Good example is if you want to get something through finance and their rule is we do twice a month payments but they like 10% discounts, I can go in and influence them to do a mid cycle payment because I'll tell the vendor, if you want that payment in that time, I need a 10 or 15% discount. I influence the vendor to give me the discount. I influence finance to do mid cycle payment because they get something they want. Everybody wins. Looking back at your, your training in the Indian Navy, how do you think your training really helps you prepare, help prepare you for the project management world? Oh, I think um, once you are in the military or any part of military, whether it's Army, Navy or Air Force, I think uh, military prepares you uh, for the uh, outside civil world with open arms because whatever they teach you there, they make you mentally tough, they make you mm -hmm. psychologically, physically tough. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, I think it's very, very simple thereafter to come down to civil world, if I may say so. Uh, so while uh, translating uh, from military skills to the civilian uh, market, uh, it may require very fine tuning a little bit here and there, but the rewards that one gets are really worth the effort. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the experiences that I can say uh, 
can be, uh, for example, the strategic vision that we talk about, the agility, the decision-making capability, the integrity, loyalty, do or die approach. I mean, we do not get any second chance. So once a project or any particular job is given to you by your senior in the military, you have to do it. There is no second thought about it. Yeah. You do it or you die. That's yeah. it. Uh, another thing, most important uh, parameter that I observed was transparency. You cannot, basically uh, military is like you are leading your men to death. And how you lead them, because they are going to follow you. Nobody joins military to say, okay, fine, I'm going to get a very good package. Ultimately, yeah. they all know what is what are you leading them up to. And you need to lead with a good strategic vision. And this particular, when you say strategic, it is an all holistic vision that a leader should have. Mm -hmm. And leadership is something which is inborn uh, in, in, in all the military leaders. And that helps uh, the commercial or the corporate world outside. Another very important thing, Marcus, that I observed was about the flexible communication skills. If you observe, a uh, lot of military uh, officers uh, are posted abroad in various uh, exigencies and they learn a lot of uh, foreign language uh, in addition to their own country uh, communication uh, languages. And this extra languages that they learn or the cultural background that they have because of their international exposure is very, very helpful to the corporate world, no doubt about it. Uh, also, uh, uh, we have, as a military veterans, uh, you can say that we are very used to the technological acumen and technological uh, advances that are there in the military. And you come across the latest technology there so you are not found wanted when you join the corporate world. You are always ahead of the curve, if I may say so. So you've had experience leading transformational changes in, in the banking environment, some of which I've, I've done okay. too. Uh, how was that experience? And, and any advice for other project managers in that, in that arena? There's two projects um, that come to mind in, in the recent years in the banking environment. Actually, one was for the Bank of Canada recently. What really made that project stand out for me was we had a very strong change management team in place. And while it was an IT transformation, it was just as much as a people transformation. And, you know, it's very important, depending on the size of the project, that you have that change management voice, if you will, um, at the steering committee le level, at the program level and at the project level, like, like all three levels. Um, that's, what, that's, that's what I experienced. So naturally it, it, it meant that the project ran smoothly um, and you know, th things like doing pilot projects and building, um, uh, you know, building uh, I guess trust and, and, and uh, early adapters and, and you know, people that, that you can use later on when, when the project inevitably goes through trials and tribulations. So those are, those are keys. And um, yeah, from my experience, uh, if, if people don't adapt to the change, then you know, the, the, the project becomes a failure because they won't end up implementing or using the technology. Now you transitioned from a project manager to a product manager. Any big difference in, in mindset between these two roles? Oh, it's much harder job to do, much harder. Um, the um, the uh, the reality is like your uh, your your role essentially is the uh, is the business role. Um, your you have um, I would say like again like no functional power. Uh, the players around you are uh, have uh, much more like. Uh, things to lose right and so it's much much uh, much more difficult to operate um, the um, y your role essentially will be a shifting but again like depending on what kind of project product manager you are but in a, <clears throat> if you're moving into the like a classical product manager role 
you will be uh, still working with teams, like pretty heavily involved. But at the same time, you will be spending a lot of time on, uh, um, I would say, discovering and uh, visualizing and negotiating the company strategy. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in this sort of negotiations, you're not the owner of this strategy. So let's say when it comes to the company, you're not an owner. So you need to kind of extract and facilitate uh, the, uh, the strategy. And very often it already exists. Uh, uh, sometimes people just do not have it like uh, written. Uh, then you will uh, somehow transfer the strategy into uh, like product strategy. I'm talking about business strategy into product strategy. And uh, then uh, realize uh, that's that's connection essentially business strategy to product strategy. In other words, uh, you're looking at the uh, some sort of strategic drivers. Uh, will uh, will pretty much define your roadmap, um, and uh, that's the work that uh, you have to do pretty much on a daily basis and refine it and refine it and refine it. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you need to sort of uh, um, push yourself to meet with customers because you have to be outward oriented. And uh, you, have, you will be meeting with people, right? And uh, very often these like uh, meetings, they, uh, they hit and miss. You still have to do them because it's very difficult to get insights. Uh, from the customers. So I would say like the, uh, if, if somebody would offer me like a role of the project manager tomorrow, I would say, oh my God, this is so easy. <laughs> it's so much easier. What are some problems with identifying and managing risks on a project and any recommendations on how to overcome these issues? Well, I think I'm actually doing a consult right now with an organization. The project managers have been doing it for a number of years and, you know, they're pretty good at what they do, but you know, they're not good at kind of looking ahead and maybe not as, as much detail as needs to be. So one of the things that I'm suggesting to them is rather than trying to figure out what might happen, because unless you've been there before, it's going to be kind of difficult to do. So instead, why don't you capture what is happening? Capture your risks. And then at the end, either of a milestone or at the end of the project, convert those issues into actual risks and write them in the, the standpoint so that they can be brought in to the next project. So rather than saying, oh, this might happen, but if I've never been in that space, it's really hard to come up with those type of situations and put together that risk register. I mean, it's based a lot on experience. So maybe taking the issues and converting them back into risks for future projects makes more sense. And that seems to be working a lot better. I know you can't wait. So stay tuned for part three with more enticing excerpts from past interviews on project management. Until then, have an amazing day. And we'll see you soon. And now a word from our sponsors. The Lewis Institute provides an enterprise project management program that does more than just train PMs. It helps support them from the CEO level on down. These courses help certify project leaders and prepare them to pass the PMP exam.